Right, so regenerative agriculture, some folks, do you guys have, does anybody have kind of a basic idea or definition of what that would be or loose concept? Uh, <laughs> so basically, um, it's an it's a agriculture that will regenerate itself, right, at the, at the most basic uh, level. So that doesn't require sort of outside inputs in a constant way, especially that where the system is, is able to regenerate itself. So some people are starting to use that. I mean, the term's been around at least since mm -hmm. the early organic movement in the U.S. in the 1940s. That was the first I'm aware of it being around. It might have even been earlier. But, um, and then John Tillman Lyle uh, used this term. Uh, he was another kind of systems designer, agroecological systems designer. And uh, Darren Doherty is, is he's got a, uh, who, has anybody heard of Darren Doherty? Several of you, I imagine, but, yeah. well, there you go, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, so he's got what he now calls Regrarians, which is a great website, regrarians.com, a great Facebook group for people, practitioners and, and interested parties into kind of a regenerative, regenerative agrarian, that's kind of what he's, his term means. Um, and some people are suggesting, well, this is, you know, we have to move past sustainability and into regenerative. And I, I understand what they're saying because the, the argument is, is kind of, well, we, don't, we wouldn't want to describe our, our marriage as just merely sustainable, right? You'd want to describe something like that as it can regenerate itself and it keeps going, and, uh, which is true. But on the other hand, there's probably... If you look at the divorce statistics, but there might be a lot of people that would be happy with just a sustainable marriage at, at, the, at that point too. I don't know, but I think they are different terms. They, they have slightly different uses. Like you wouldn't have, you could have a, a sustainable table, for example, but you're not going to have a regenerative table, right? The table doesn't need to regenerate itself. It could be made with wood that was produced in a regenerative way but the table itself could be sustainable versus regenerative. So they're slightly different concepts, um, so just make you aware of that language around there. Does anybody know what this uh, is a map of? Let me just turn this on. Okay, so this kind of outline part here, I suppose. I don't know if this laser shows up very well on that. But, you know, the green outline in essence. Yeah, California's part is included, or part of California is included. Um, so what it's called is the California Floristic Province. So it, some of you biodiversity hotspot people might have heard of it under that name. Um, and, but the point of this is this, this is where I grew up, um, right in the middle of that. But I had no concept that I was growing up in a highly biodiverse area because cause by that time it had all kind of changed into... Uh, you know, the San Joaquin Valley was where I grew up, but it, you know, that, a lot of that biodiversity had been lost, even though it is still quite biodiverse, um, but it's mostly, it was mostly in agriculture. It's the most dense location of agriculture on, on the planet there, and not, not regenerative agriculture either. Uh, so I'm just going to give myself a bit more space. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So anyhow, growing up there, not having realized as a kid that, oh, I was living in an environment that had lost 90% of its wetlands, that had you know, lost huge, huge portions of, of the biodiversity that used to be there. And that was a biodiversity that was both because of the natural effects, geology and plant vegetation and different climates coming together and, and all of that diversity of biophysical factors, but it was also a factor of that humans had been managing that landscape for you know, 10 to 14,000 years. Um, they'd come into it about 14,000 years prior and had been pretty actively managing it, at least 10. And so, uh, you know, that's in res the res resilience folks will think of a social ecological system, right, where humans and, and the natural world are, are a single kind of unit in essence. You know, they can't really separate them. Well, that area supported 10% of the whole population of North America at that time. Um, so it was really dense with people, which is really 10 times the amount uh, of average hunter-gatherer densities. 
um, globally. So that kind of speaks to the diversity both that was there but also was increased and amplified by the human interaction that was taking place. Um, so when I learned that later after growing up, I didn't know it when I grew up there, I was, that's one of the really fascinating things that, that has you know, driven my interest in a lot of this is, is how humans can couple with these landscapes um, to, you know, to, to provide that you know, ecosystem services above and beyond what would be possible by, by simply the landscape alone, potentially. Because those would have been largely, like I said, wetlands and then these savanna type ecosystems in California, and, and they, there still are. Uh, there's still much of that, and there still is much biodiversity, but we can only really imagine what had been there uh, in the past to some degree. But savannas on their own are highly diverse landscapes, many of you will know. So, I mean, they have the largest and deepest kind of solar collection surface of any ecosystem, um, terrestrial biome at least. And of course, all of our livestock species would have originated in savanna landscapes, you know, cows, goats, sheep, pigs, uh, poultry. So they're all domesticated savanna species. So, and obviously humans emerged out of these as well. That's, that's really our, our ancestral home, if you will. So uh, it's, it's also the terrestrial ecosystem that supports the most amount of mammal biomass of any uh, of any other. So th those fascinate me and this is one of the uh, areas that we're going in, in this regenerative agriculture is to sort of increase areas that are savannas. So put, put trees back into grasslands and, and then you know thin out forests that have become too dense to allow grass back into those. So there's, there's a bit of both of those that go on in, in a lot of these regenerative systems and certainly the ones that I'm working with and, and helping to uh, design and plan. So this is sort of what I've been up to. I've been on this kind of pathway uh, since 2006, really, doing this work. And so this is just some of the design work. And, and uh, you know, starting then was when I took my permaculture course. Then I very shortly thereafter took a key line design course, which was from Darren Doherty, was where I, where I got that. And then he's been a mentor. Uh, I've had you know, other really valuable mentors along the way. I became a holistic management certified educator in that process as well. How many have heard of holistic management? A few of you, but we'll talk, we'll talk a bit more about that and how that plays, because that's one of the main frameworks that I use for this also. Um, and I mean, other than that, I had lived in Zimbabwe for, for a year, so I had some experiences that would have contributed. I was doing game management basically on a, on a, a couple hundred thousand acre a uh, ranch with an E, they call it down there, uh, ranch. Um, and although that was a long time ago, I really had no clue what I was doing. I was just uh, trying to learn tracking and keeping track of animals and this, that, and the other, and having a good time, uh, mostly. So, so yeah, after, after uh, getting those holistic frameworks to this, because part of my background as well was um, I had a master's in Eastern philosophy. so. Uh, I, th I felt that that was really helpful for me in trying to wrap my head around how do we apply holistic thinking to agriculture and to you know, human coupled systems. How do we apply, there's really uh, several of the traditions at least in Eastern philosophy would be, I think of them as kind of the first systems thinking that humans were doing in an in a active tradition. Um, other than just the natural born systems thinkers that, that humans are I think. Um, it was the first of that in a tradition. So kind of all of those experiences have, have, you know, the place I'm at now with all of that, it, I'm calling it the, a dynamic design approach. And so out of the resilience literature, they talk about combining different types of knowledge. And so I'm trying to apply that approach. So there's many different frameworks that, uh, I, that I try to use and integrate or have on the table to bring to any given situation. And this is a, a partial list, I suppose, but I would say mainly the core of it is, is holistic management, probably these larger ones, right? Holistic management, key line design, resilience, um, the silvo pastoral kind of wood pasture stuff, savanna agriculture, you might say, uh, permaculture, kind of harnessing the power of, of self organization in nature, landscape ecology. So, anyhow, but you'll notice that, that it's not all 
biophysical planning methods. There's a lot of social methods embedded here as well. Because um, I learned very, very early on in the process with one of my first clients that, you know, going in with the idea, coming off a permaculture course, saying, oh, we've got the best techniques. We're just, it's going to be fantastic. We just go in there and put them in and you're done, you know, like job's over. But of course, <laughs> as I'm sure many of you are working in different systems like this, it's the social pieces that, that are falling down the first, right? And if you don't have those working, the rest of it's not going to be working. Uh, so, you know, that's when I learned I need to learn a lot more about the social side of things, don't I? Uh, to, to be able to make these things be effective. So there's other folks, of course, out there who are uh, using a variety of frameworks um, to do this stuff. But kind of the way I think about how do these fit together is just bringing a lot of different options to the table to any given situation. You might not use every single one every single time, or you might use parts and pieces and kind of do some hybridizing. Um, but you can tailor something quite sophisticated to the actual scenario that you're dealing with in this way. Uh, and so I kind of conceive of it like um, this study, which was on ectomycorrhizal um, rhizomes, essentially. Um, so these are the green dots are all trees. Uh, and then the, the kind of glue holding them together, so to speak, is these fungal colonies. Um, so I think about the different frameworks as maybe being something like the trees and the, the dynamic design approach as, as this kind of fungal or rise upon, rise upon that's, that's connecting these things together. Um, and you could do a little network analysis on it as well, which they did in this paper. But, um, but the main issue here is, is about navigating complexity. And so complexity theory and thinking is, is really kind of informing a lot of what I'm doing as well, as um, you know, that's a lot of what I've been studying the last many years. In the basic situation that we're, we often find ourselves in, or people managing land or, or farmers, um, is that we don't, we don't have enough information to make a perfect decision, um, but yet we need to do something because doing nothing also has consequences. Um, and so we're kind of in this situation of, of where there's uncertainty that's just not reducible. And as you guys are, are well aware of the resilience framework, they're bringing up that as a major issue, right? There's always going to be uncertainty that we can't eliminate. Um, so humans are, are somewhere between, you know, complete mystery and partial mastery of some things, right? So we're, we're in an interesting balance. So the question is, you know, how do we get started in that situation? How do we figure out how to learn within uh, an essentially unknowable cosmos in many ways, right? And the way to do that, of course, is to engage. And I have three steps in, in the approach that I'm taking, um, which I'll go over now. So in this dynamic design, say the first step is that we have to start with the heart. Um, and the reason for that is, that is the heart is where we feel called to anything. The heart is where we recognize what we care about. It's only what we care about that we'll take responsibility for. So if you don't start there, um, you're unlikely to keep, you know, keep going for the long haul on, on getting done what needs to get done, on having the attitude that it takes to, to make things happen. Um, and the heart is also where renewal begins. So in holistic management, we, that would be part of this step. We would create a, a holistic goal or holistic context, which is basically a vision that uh, accounts for the land, that accounts for the people that are involved in that system, and it accounts for the finances, because obviously uh, all of those things have to be functioning uh, for you to get anywhere. So if we start with the heart, um, then we engage with the whole. Um, that's something else from holistic management, is that nature functions in holes. Um, so engaging with the whole, managing a whole, I think it's one of the major paradigm shifts in land management in general here at the, uh, in the new century, is, is managing holes instead of managing parts. But holistic management was on to this pretty far ahead of the game. Um, but to engage with that, one of the processes I use is called the scale of permanence from Keyline, uh, which just gives an ordered structure to doing land planning. And of course, the people part can be interwoven throughout all of that. But uh, if you're planning for like a, a farm, for example, this is a very, very good process. Um, 
uh, to use. So that's one way to engage with, with the whole. Um, and then the third step is to enact what our human role is and enact our human role. So I have this photo down here of the, the child with the hands, it's got kind of the world. So that what we're thinking of there is, is the fact that the you know, we have to manage, we have to manage the landscapes that we're working with. Um, that's part of our, our role, that's part of our interaction with them. And the Latin for, for management, of course, comes from the same as manos in, in Spanish, right? Hands. So it's, they have the same root. So that's just there to kind of, you know, uh, management is a very hands-on thing in, a way, in, in the way that we're thinking about it here. And then the other thing is, is I suppose, much deeper, right? These, these cave paintings um, showing kind of how humans have been connected to landscapes and animals in the landscape for uh, as, as long as there have been humans. And how part of that has always been a very active cycle of learning. How a critical part of that has always been a very uh, ongoing, moment-to-moment -moment cycle of learning. Where, as a hunter-gatherer, if, if you weren't, didn't learn how to you know, achieve your goal uh, of, of feeding yourself, you got very rapid feedback in that system and you had to adjust very rapidly. Um, because if you, you know, if you weren't on it, it was, it was going to be, well, you, were, you just weren't going to continue in essence, right? Um, and so that's part of the role too, I think, uh, as, as humans, is learning and, and paying attention to that active kind of lerp of getting the feedback and responding to it uh, proactively, if you can. Uh, all right, so, so here's just kind of another graphic to, you know, visualize the process. If this first part is kind of start with the heart, that kind of like gives us our vision, our goal, our, our compass, our true north. Where are we heading towards? The next section is, is the process of, of doing the land planning, engaging with the whole, doing the land planning and the implementation. And then the third part, enacting the role. It's, it's kind of centered on that vision, which may be evolving, but it's also in, engaging that active learning loop. Uh, so that we can continue to, uh, you know, co-evolve with the system that, that we're working with as, as humans uh, will, whether they recognize it or not. So what holistic management brings to the table in all this is kind of this idea that nature functions in holes and that we can manage holes. And I, I think a big part of that, that, that paradigm shift I was mentioning that has to do with this is moving from seeing farms or land or systems that we're managing as being systems out there to recognizing our, ourselves as an integral part that we're managing from within a system. We're not at all separate from it. Uh, I think that's one of the major kind of conceptual shifts that's been happening um, and an important one. And then goals, the idea of, of managing towards a vision, the idea and this can, it would be always an evolving vision and, and co-evolving with what's actually happening on the land and with the people and with the finances. Um, but the importance of having that out there as uh, to help guide decision making. And it, of course, the last part is decisions. Holistic management has developed a very effective uh, uh, process, almost you know, the simplest way of thinking of it was kind of like a checklist because many of you would have heard of some of the studies on checklisting and stuff and how effective that can be in certain scenarios. Well, it's a bit like that, but with some more detail to it. So you make a decision based on first, what is your vision? And then you use this checklist of questions in essence, or uh, you know, filter questions. We like to think of them as by the time you've, there's seven of them, by the time you've gone through all of those, you feel like you've really comprehensively thought through that situation and you've accounted for the land, you've accounted for social issues, you've accounted for the financial parts of it. Um, and the last question is just a gut check. So you also include very consciously, you know, what is my gut saying about this? Um, that's an important part of human decision making as well. So the first principle of holistic management was developed uh, by Jan Smuts, who's a South African statesman. So the South Africans in the room will will probably recognize this guy. Uh, very well known, but he's well known in England too. He went to college here. There's a statue of him in London at uh, somewhere. Where is it? <laughs> Somebody might know. 
but it's by one of the Fox those fan yeah it's exactly it's by in by one of those fancy buildings, um, and he was he was a both a statesman but also spent a lot of time in the bush. Uh, he said the bush felt is a place that grips you and subdues you and makes you one with yourself. I think that was partly where he was getting some of these ideas about holism, but actually it was also uh, Walt Whitman, the American poet, who wrote Leaves of Grass. So it keeps going back to grassland somehow. Uh, uh, that actually inspired his, his writing around this as well. He published a book, Holism and Evolution, in, in 1926. Um, and kind of the major thrust of that is this idea that nature functions in holes, which was adopted then by Alan Savory, who developed holistic management. And as it, Einstein read this book at the time, and uh, Albert Einstein that is, and he said that there were going to be two important things over the next hundred years. One was going to be relativity, um, so he toot his own horn a little bit there, uh, and the other was going to be Smut's holism. So uh, and we'll, we'll keep touching back on this idea of holes, but the other thing holistic management brought to the table that really hadn't been recognized before was that context matters in the sense of what type of environment you're in, basically whether it's is it more dry or more moist um, environment, but it, there's technically there's a scale of one to ten on that, but it's, it's the general idea is are you drier or are you wet, wetter? Um, how does decomposition happen in your environment? I mean that's the major difference between those two, right? It's on this side it's biological, on this side it's most of the year it would be physical or chemical weathering of, of, of biological material. Um, so depending on where you are on that brittleness scale, different tools that you might apply to land management will have different effects um, in many cases, so, such as resting the land, for example. If you rest the land in a humid environment, you're just going to go in a successional process in the direction of the climax, which I understand is, is, is not a, uh, I just use it as a shorthand, I know there's a lot of nonlinear stuff that can happen, but, uh, but that's the general trend that you're going to see, right? Like going towards more and more uh, higher successional plants. Now in a brittle or arid environment, if you rest that from, uh, from grazing, um, you, you, may, you may improve it, especially if it's been degraded a lot, for a short period of time. Then you'll start to go backwards again. Your successional process will start to go backwards again. So that's, that's one of the things that Savory recognized um, that's, uh, <coughs> that hadn't really been brought up before, largely because most of our land management Paradigms come from uh, from from Europe. From uh, I'm not trying to blame you guys, but uh, <laughs> but and then they've gone out to other parts of the world, which are much have much different environments, and tried to apply those. And it's taken some time for us to figure out. Oh, this isn't quite working because um, we're in a different environment. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the terminology that Savory uses, and but that basically just means arid or drier or an environment where you have you know, much less rainfall throughout most of the year um, than you would in a humid, or where decomposition is physical and chemical rather than biological most of the year. During the rainy season, you'll get a, li a little bit of it. But the other really actually critical piece of that, so if this is your, uh, your year, so you've got January to December, Give myself a little bit more room again. Um, and this is uh, sort of the amount of, of, of life or you know, actively decomposing biology uh, in the system. In your kind of more humid, non-brittle type systems, you know, you'll be up here most of the year and it'll be fairly even. Does that make sense? And then in these drier, drier sort of environments, you don't have much of this biological decomposition or life in the system going on until you hit, and you know, maybe it's a summer rain system and then you, you suddenly get a, a spike around there and then most of the rest of the year again, you just don't have a lot going on. So your rate of nutrient cycling, that process in those systems just really, really goes very slowly through here and you're losing a lot of nutrient right through oxidation 
and this kind of stuff. And so that was the other important piece that Savory recognized, was that these, these systems evolved with massive herds of, of grazing herbivores, right, who are taking this, and, they, and they're actually the ones, or actually the, the critters in their, in their guts that are actually the ones where this is still happening potentially all year if they're in the system. You take them out of the system, that system will degrade. That's why if you overrest these landscapes, they'll go backwards. Uh, that's somebody, something that uh, nobody had really put together that way before. He developed that. Um, so that's one of the contributions of holistic management. And we'll, we'll go a bit more into some of the grazing stuff. Uh, assuming we, we have time, we'll have, we'll have some time. <laughs> then resilience thinking, you guys would know uh, a lot about this as this is part of your major mission um, at, at this institution. But you know the importance of understanding thresholds, I think that's as important as understanding brittleness, for example. Um, adaptability and kind of understanding the adaptive cycle, where, where your system is on the adaptive cycle, how it fits within that larger nested panarchy of adapted cycles, um, how that's impacting the dynamics at the scale that you're working at. All of those things are a critical piece that resilience thinking has, has brought to it. Um, persistence, this idea of how does the system stay persistent when the context itself is, is going through large changes. Um, and then part of my favorite part of resilience thinking um, is, is the transformation aspect. The idea that you know, when a system isn't working, we can actively transform this in a positive direction um, into, you know, to structure the feedbacks in a different way that are supporting a much more viable, uh, much more productive or desirable um, attract or, or basin of attraction. And also from resilience thinking, the, the idea of the social ecological system, or, you know, which to me lines up very well with Smut's holism, um, where you, know, you ultimately can trace complexity theory and all the different systems theory back to Smut's, even though I don't think he gets uh, that much credit uh, for that usually. Um, but he was really the first one to start talking. If you read the holism and evolution, it's, it's quite sophisticated, his outlining of the whole thing. It's, it's not like he... It's not like rudimentary and then everyone else built on it. It's, it's actually pretty current, a lot of the thinking in it. Um, so in any case, this idea of social ecologicalism as a single whole that, yeah, conceptually we can separate humans and landscapes, um, but, in, but in reality, you know, perhaps ontologically, that's not really, you know, they're, they're a single tissue. Uh, so then the other, sort of planning framework of that, that I use a lot is key line design. And some of you would have heard about it when Darren came through. Um, and this was developed by P.A. Yeomans in Australia in the 1940s. And uh, that's one of his properties that he developed. And so you can kind of get a sense of what those kind of landscapes would actually look like. This is in New South Wales. Um, but he was one of the first Australians, I think, to come up against what, what I mentioned before, like, hey, these, these European management techniques are not working in this landscape. What do we do now? He actually you know, lost his, his brother-in-law in a fire in the midst of a drought after they had just gone into the agriculture business. He came out of uh, mining. He came out of the mining industry, uh, the mining engineer. Uh, so he learned a lot, actually, from the Chinese immigrants who were in Australia, as they were in my part of the world, in California, uh, for the gold rush and that for similar reasons in Australia. But the Chinese understood how to move water around landscapes. They'd been doing mining much longer than we've been doing it in the West. Um, they had been, they understood the water cycle. Uh, I think 1,500 years, if not 2,000 prior to Da Vinci finally putting that together. Oh yeah, it goes in the whole cycle. Well, so they knew water and, and he learned a lot of that from them, but also learned about earth moving from um, his mining engineer days. So he, he was into building these water storages and he would connect them up through the landscape. So when one would overflow, it would fill into the next and so on. And he could gravity irrigate out of this. So you have a lot more pasture uh, production and 
Grazing animals were always a part of that system as well. So it integrated a whole lot of things and it's really the first uh, farm planning book that takes a whole holistic perspective in essence. Um, that was in the 40s when he developed that. He passed away in the 1980s, um, but of course his, his system continues to kind of expand, not to where the level we might like to see it, but the other thing is it does integrate well with a lot of these other things we're talking about, like holistic management, permaculture has something to add to this uh, as well. So here's another picture of one of those landscapes. So I'm just going to get a better surface for the mouse. Oh wait, here's one. <laughs> An actual mouse surface. Um, I have this up on that thing because because I have my coffee up here and there's an intake on the bottom and if it spills it sucks it up and then $1,500 later it's a <laughs> it's not a good story. All right, so where's the mouth? Here it is. This is a, a kind of a satellite view of one of the landscapes that Yom's developed. So these tree lines are on roughly, they're on what are called key lines, but it's roughly, it's equivalent to contour. Not precisely, but, but roughly. Um, but the general pattern of a key line pattern will end up spreading the water out that, you know, that is received as evenly as possible across any landscape surface. Um, and that's, that's the approach to uh, healing the water cycle that he had. And, and like I said, uh, animals, grazers, were always part of this, as they are in any, his systems are essentially savanna systems. He didn't talk about them that way, but that's, it's essentially trees and grass and animals. And savanna systems are driven by the dynamics of grazing. Um, well, so was, so was his approach. Uh, he had what's called a, so I mean, this picture is more recent from one of his properties as well, so it's still being used that way. So they're, they're quite um, durable, they're quite persistent in the landscape, these, these farms. What, what kind of rainfall is, is that ranging? In uh, where he was, I think he had about a 30 inch rainfall in New South Wales where he was. It might have been as high as 40, somewhere between 30 and 40. I probably have it in my notes somewhere, but, um, but yeah, but he was, you know, those ponds that you saw, they were all connected, dams or ponds. Can't remember what you guys call them, but probably both. Uh, we call them both. They, I believe they held 860 acre feet of, of water in total. I know that was, that was the acreage, so I think it was 1,250 acre feet of water on 860 acres um, of, of storage capacity. So his, this was kind of his planning backbone um, called the scale of permanence. So if you've got so it's basically eight kind of elements to doing the land planning. Kind of this is the engaging with the whole part. Um, and on this axis you have kind of the change effort or the amount of energy that goes into changing that element. More difficult at the top, it's easier at the bottom. And down on the bottom, it's the relative permanence of that element in your system. You know, how much time is that hanging around? Um, more time down at that end, less time at this end. Well, climate turns out to be the most difficult to change in the thing that lasts the longest, um, although of course we're, we're managing to do it. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, land shape, but water was really the first thing, yeah, we can move some land shape around to some degree, but we're, we're not going to influence massively the overall shape of the land that's between climate and geology to work out, isn't it? Uh, water is the first place that we can really start to have a, a really significant influence, how we address the water cycle how we move water around the landscape, and then roads and access, or trees or perennial woody systems, structures and buildings, subdivision and fencing, you know, how we break up the land, how the fencing supports our grazing management, that kind of a thing. And then lastly, soil, which is one of the revolutionary things Yoma's developed as well. So, you know, if, if you go to a geology course, they'll tell you it takes a thousand years to create an inch of topsoil. But of course, they're only, you know, they've, they haven't incorporated social ecological systems into geology yet, have they? So, yeah, that's just a purely biophysical thing. But if you include the human in the system and the way that we manage that, um, there are people generating an inch of topsoil very, very rapidly. So, even several inches a year in some cases, using a variety of these techniques, synergizing together. Now, that's not soil from, from the ground up. 
that soil from the top, from the top down, subsoil into topsoil. That's what's going on with that. Um, and it turns out that one is one we can change the most rapidly. Although electric fencing now, you can probably change more rapidly than soil. He didn't have so much electric fencing infrastructure when he developed the scale. But interestingly, soil then feeds back into the climate one, right? Because that's, that's a way we can address, um, you know, by, by pulling that atmospheric carbon dioxide, uh, you know, getting that carbon into the soil, sequestering it there for long periods of time through a liquid carbon pathway. Um, we, there's actually, so we'll look at a little bit of that too, if you guys are interested. Probably should speed along here a bit, but, um, because there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about. <laughs> um, broad acre permaculture, kind of, permaculture, you know, I, I make the argument would not exist if it hadn't been for key line design. So this is Bill Mollison's farm in Australia. Does it remind you of any of the other pictures that, that we've seen? Yeah, he was hugely influenced by P.A. Yeoman's work, uh, as was David Holmgren. So those are the guys that, that developed permaculture for, uh, for any who haven't uh, heard of them, but, um, <coughs> Kind of what it brings to the table is, is you know, it's centered around ethics, which are, which are important, of course. And somebody in here knows the permaculture ethics, right? Do they want to share what those are? Land share, people share, and fair share. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Roughly. So, yeah. So, yeah. Caring, <laughs> caring, caring for people, or caring for earth, caring for people, and, yeah. and, and some people call the third one fair share, but which basically has two parts. It's, you know, taking your fair share, like living within limits, um, and then returning kind of the surplus that you generate back into the system or returning that uh, somehow to, you know, to the whole process. Um, and there's design principles that come with, with permaculture. There's 12 design principles, which are pretty useful uh, kind of rules of thumb in any type of systems design. Um, including, you know, not only biological systems, but, uh, you know, business, uh, interpersonal relationship, you can apply those to a lot of things, because um, they're quite general rules of thumb. And then the idea of a design science, kind of a science of being able to design these things, which is very similar to agroecology and, and you know, all that you guys are, are well aware of. So, Something else I like to work with in, the, in all of this is, uh, is the planetary boundaries framework. You guys, no doubt, would have mostly be aware of this um, from 2009. So it's a paper in Nature, Johan Rockström. So the Stockholm Resilience Center guy and some of his scientists developed this paper. And they recently updated it as well. So there's a, there's a bit of an update. But these are what, <laughs> so the issue here is So I'm skipping around a couple of things, but uh, you know, is w you, this would have been the uh, last hundred thousand years of, of kind of temperature of climate, uh, and obviously in the last ten thousand years, the only period where we developed agriculture, the only period where we developed civilization, um, incredibly stable relative to the rest of that, isn't it? There's hardly any margin of uh, of range of movement there um, in comparison to the rest of it. So it's been kind of in a blessed or in a, you know, a period state of grace, let's say, for the last 10,000 years climate wise. Now, of course, you know, we're, we're out here somewhere now. So we're actually outside of this whole range even. We're um, in terms of where that graph would be now. And so what this planetary boundaries is talking about is if we look at that kind of center where the globe is, this would represent that Holocene stability, that Holocene kind of climate regime. So we know that's a safe operating space as far as human civilization, as far as um, the, our ability to, to do what we do currently. Um, and so they've actually quantitatively identified uh, nine different boundaries at an Earth system science level. Um, that need to be maintained to maintain that, that climate regime. Now we're outside of those boundaries on, on several of those. Obviously biodiversity loss, we're in the sixth mass extinction. 
there's been some real recent work on that as well uh, that's come out in the last couple weeks even or something like that, the last month at least. Um, the nitrogen cycle, where's this coming from? Sorry? Fertilizer, right, right, Pre precisely, yeah. And, uh, and climate change, we're outside that boundary now too. And we're approaching it on some of these others. And kind of the gray areas are the ones they haven't precisely quantified yet. There's still some you know, uncertainty around where exactly those boundaries might be. So the idea here is that this gives us actually uh, something to aim for, in a sense. So this is a global uh, analysis, but it's starting to be, you know, there's scientists working on breaking this down into regional boundaries, so you would know where you stood in your region on each of these. And, you know, the, the farm designs I do, I try to break it down to just the farm level, and like how can we stay within these boundaries on, on the farm level. So it's multi kind of scaled ways to apply this framework um, with, with the whole goal of kind of achieving a better a climate regime that we know we can continue to develop in, not the same thing as growth necessarily, but I know development is part of your guys' mission as well, so hopefully you have, you know, have some reason to think that that's possible. Um, so anyhow, uh, that's a really, that's a critical paper and, and perspective, I think, to bring to all this. And part of what it speaks to is in what we talk about in holistic management, it's managing for what we do want. We do want that safe operating space, right, uh, for the planet and for people. Oh, and the other point I should make about this before we go too much further is essentially all of those boundaries are the sector that affects them, impacts them most negatively would be agriculture. Uh, and to me, this isn't a, a, an accusation or a, well, I suppose it's an accusation, but I mean, it's a, it's a claim, but uh, what I mean is it's, I'm not trying to focus on, oh, agriculture is so bad. What's exciting to me about that is that's an enormous opportunity. That is an enormous opportunity. If, we, if the way we do agriculture can fit in those boundaries, and it can, we know it, that it can, from the, uh, you know, at least at the farm level, that many different farms and ranches that I'm working with would operate well within that. Um, that's a massive, massive impact on, on globally on these so it's just a matter of, it's not that human impact is a bad thing, it's how that impact uh, uh, is carried out, what direction that impact is taking us. Um, so anyway, that's the way I like to think about that. So we want to manage for what we do want, um, not for what we don't want, because what we find is either way we get what we manage for or we're likely to get what we're managing for. Does that make sense? So manage for what we do want, likely to get it. Manage for what you don't want, oh, well, you're likely to get what you don't want. All right, so the example here being in the, in the US, and I'm sure it's not extraordinarily different here, um, we spend an awful lot of time, energy, and money to control noxious weeds, manage for what we don't want. And so what do we see as are the trends in noxious weeds? Are they? Increase. Yeah. Yeah, they're just, so, you know, it's because uh, we're out there spraying basically super weed creators that, they, that they've, marketing people have named weed killers. And of course, global soil loss is, is another uh, big issue with the way that we're currently doing agriculture. Um, and this is probably nothing too new to you guys, but yeah, so it's 70 billion tons a year that we're losing in, in soil, um, you know, through the, through the way we're doing agriculture that leads to all these other problems. And so the way that stacks up, the ratio is you lose 10 tons of soil for every half ton of, of food that gets produced, and it takes roughly a half ton to feed a person for a year. So. Yeah, how does that work out? I mean, that's an extraordinarily maladaptive agriculture, isn't it? Not to mention that this little green half ton is not what really what we could call food. You know, at best, it's kind of a semi-food substance. Um, it's, it's producing really poor nutrition and extraordinarily expensive health outcomes uh, globally, and especially in the West, perhaps. Um, <coughs> So it's not just a maladaptive agriculture, it's a malnutrition agriculture. 
And I would argue, really, it's not even agriculture. It's not even a food system. We have yet to build a food system. So we're not really producing real food. Um, what we are producing is 10 tons of topsoil gone for every half ton of kind of byproduct of that system. It's not an agriculture, it's a topsoil removal machine with a very small byproduct of semi-food. So then back to navigating complexity. We don't have enough information, but we need to do something. Where do we start? We find that starting with holes, managing holes, is a really effective way to get going. Um, so, I mentioned that nature functions in holes. Uh, part, of, part of that is that within a hole, there are, no really, there are really no parts, there are only participants. This is just one way to think about it, one kind of perspective on it. Holes are not necessarily made of parts, but they're made of participants. Because really it's the interactions of the different elements, their relationships, through time as those are co-evolving, that produce kind of an emergent sort of structure that we call a whole, right? And then that structure constrains those elements and their interactions, just like, uh, just like in society, right? Like if there was only one person on the island of England, uh, they would behave a lot differently than somebody who lives on the island now, more than likely, because the whole society constrains an individual's behavior to some degree, even though that society as a whole is, is only just an emergent uh, structure from all the interactions of all the individuals. Um, so it's those interactions that create the whole. And so one way to think about it, no parts, only participants. So the whole is kind of the context also, our context. And this is Alan Savory. And he asks the question to groups a lot of times he's talking to, shall I light a fire? Any, any, anybody have an answer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Away we go. I like it. I like it. That's right. We need to take more risks, don't we? Uh, but his point being, you can't possibly you know, give a, a, rash, you know, a good answer to that without understanding the context. Am I in a building? Am I, uh, what am I trying to accomplish? What, you know, what's going on? Why would I want to light a fire? But, so having a context is, is what really allows meaning. Understanding yourself within the context of a whole gives meaning. It's impossible to understand ourselves, I argue, as individuals without understanding ourselves as species first. But that's our context. So and it allows for prediction. If you understand the context, you can, you can make better predictions. Even in you know, irreducible uncertainty, which we know is out there, um, you can at least make better uh, predictions because there's a bit of constancy, it's a bit of a constraint out there. So one of the, uh, I mentioned before, the holistic context, uh, and that's just made up of three parts, and it, we can map it onto these permaculture ethics. You guys hear me okay still? So? <laughs> uh, which is, you know, earth care, people care, and return the surplus, live in limits. So quality of life is the first part of the holistic context. So this is the vision that we set for the whole that we're managing. And that speaks to people care, I expect, right? What is the quality of life we, we want to have? So we're managing for what we do want. And the second element is just forms of production, which basically you look at each of the quality of life elements. Uh, I want to have a balance between work and family. Let's say that's one of your quality of life elements. Well, what do you have to produce to make that actually occur in life? So you list it down. This would be different for everybody, right? But maybe, well, I need to produce a, a monthly calendar that, you know, that allocates time for both in a balanced way or whatever it might be. A lot of people for quality of life need some kind of financial security or uh, the form of production is likely to be, you know, making income or a profit off of some type of activity. You don't have to define the activity, but you have to define what you need. That gives you flexibility to use whatever activity you can that still meets your quality of life and your goal requirements. And the last part is the future resource base. So particularly if you're managing land, how does that land have to be functioning far into the future 
in order to allow me to, to do those forms of production to allow me to have that quality of life. They just build on each other. So once you've kind of mapped that out, either for yourself or for the whole group of decision makers in the whole that you're managing, um, or even if you want to take this into policy, you could do it, do a general one on a national level, for example. Um, that, that's actually very useful in, in policy sort of discussions. Uh, so in any case, uh, foreign production would, would match up to this creating a surplus. You can't, you know, because most people do have to create some kind of surplus to, for their quality of life. Well, if, and this says return the surplus. Well, you can't return a surplus you don't have. Um, future resource base is taking care of the land. How do the ecosystem processes have to function far into the future to support what you want to do? So ecosystem processes are the other part of holistic management that, uh, that is really, really useful. So for example, in permaculture, there's one of the principles is to observe and interact. Um, but holistic management gives you a, a kind of four windows to observe and interact, like specific ways. Because you could just come into nature or whatever you're trying to observe and say, well, what am I looking at? Well, holistic management says, you're looking at the water cycle, you're looking at the mineral cycle, you know, the uh, nutrient cycle. You're looking at community dynamics, kind of the, the processes of, of succession and coevolution of organisms. And you're looking at energy flow, right? When the, once the sunlight hits the land, what happens? What, that goes through the whole trophic food web and all that, right? So there are four different windows on ex the exact same hole. We understand they're not four different things. They're just four different ways of looking at them. And if we can manage those four things for, you know, so that they're healthy, that they're really functional, ecosystem processes all stem from those. So these are the source of all the ecosystem, uh, I'm sorry, ecosystem services is what I meant to say. There's a lot of talk about that um, over the last decade or so, ecosystem service, ecosystem. But for my money, it's ecosystem processes that uh, are worth the most attention because they're the ultimate source of any services we get. Um, that's what's going to supply them if those processes are, are functioning. Um, right. How are you guys doing? <laughs> we got another 15 minutes to break or so? Uh, let's see what else we can get in here that's interesting. Um, well, this whole idea of, of self-organization um, so if we're planning for a, a dynamic whole, we want to nurture this process called self-organization, which I think is kind of another ecosystem process in our way, or maybe it's a meta process that kind of drives the other four. Um, you, you know, their galaxies are formed this way, right? Um, uh, it's a very powerful force in nature, essentially a creative force. In permaculture, they talk about work with nature. Well, I think it's really we're working with self-organization, with the, the process that nature uh, does to produce emergent uh, behaviors, emergent uh, elements, figures. And what the science is telling us is that self-organized holes capture more resources, like energy and material. They make more effective use of those resources. They build more structure, and they increase resilience. So part of the way they, that self-organization builds more structure is, is just at a thermodynamic level even. You know, most people think of thermodynamics as just only the process of entropy, but actually as uh, kind of the other side of it is like maybe you guys have seen in some of Prigogine's work with uh, uh, dissipative structures. Um, so you, you can YouTube some of the stuff on the uh, is there any chemists in the room? <laughs> the, uh, boy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slaughter the name, but it's the Bazitov-Tinsky reaction or something. That, but if, if you just put in the BZ reaction on YouTube or something, you can just watch like in a chemical way self-organization happening. Uh, basically, there's an energy gradient in the chemicals, and in order to transform that energy, transform that gradient, um, structures emerge to more rapidly transform that. Well, that's essentially what <laughs> ecosystems do with sunlight, 
right? You have sunlight as an energy gradient. There's a temperature gradient between the Earth and the space as well. Um, the more forms of life that evolve to transform that energy, to process it, um, the more structures kind of emerge to do that. So it actually fits with the thermodynamics, even though that's a very complicated topic. Um, <laughs> but, so, but that's part of what's driving self-organization. But this works in human systems as well. And this is so some of the kind of social process stuff that, that I use. Um, we use this in Jordan um, in 2011 at the permaculture, international permaculture convergence there, which was in Wadi Rum. This is where they shot uh, Lawrence of Arabia. It's a very beautiful sort of landscape, but also kind of hot uh, <laughs> and dry. And here's Bill Mollison and his wife at that event. Well, so it's called International Permaculture Convergence 10. Um, so it was a four-day event. So the first three days was kind of a standard sort of a conference. And so in the course of that three days, so they had scheduled speakers, three parallel sessions all day long, right? Like you guys have all been to conferences like this, right? Um, we, so we had just over 50 one-hour long talks that happened over three days, and which, were, which were really good and enjoyable. And you know, uh, you know how that can be. So what we did then was we used a process called open space technology. And so basically I had been working on this for several months before arriving. But on the day as a facilitator, I did very, very little. It's a pro because it's a process that works on self-organization of the group and what the group is passionate about. They take responsibility for and they and they go at it. So I'll just quickly go through some of the pictures from that. We have very simple rules that guide it. Be prepared to be surprised, right? Whatever happens is the only thing that could have. Very simple rules, that's all, but that's all you need to structure uh, a self-organized kind of process. Often only three to five rules. You know, Holling would call that the rule of hand for in panarchy and the resilience stuff. Um, people are just invited around a theme to take up their own topics. We start with a wall that's completely blank as far as the agenda. Um, and then within the first 45 minutes, the agenda is full for the day and people go to work. So we covered 50 separate hour-long topic sessions in a single day by doing this. That's self-organization at work. We didn't have to schedule anything. Just people showed up. I just walked around and picked up trash mostly. I went and took a shower in the afternoon. It was getting hot. They were doing all the work. So uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful thing, both in social and natural systems, and coupled social and natural systems. But I'll just click through some of the rest of the slides so you can just get a sense of whoever comes is the right people. So you start a session, whoever shows up to it, that's who should be there. Uh, just people having fun. And then we have a newsroom so that we can capture, uh, kind of document what happened in all the sessions. So if you didn't go to a session, people taking naps, didn't go to a session, uh, you can read about what happened later. And you get to see all the people that were at the session. If it's something you're really interested in, you can email them, get in touch. She's drawing some of the permaculture uh, principles, logos. Um, and then there's a bit of a circle at the end um, where we just come back together and kind of quickly go around the circle. And then we kept the newsroom open into the nighttime. So people were just, it was just like a hive of activity. And there's a bit of dancing going on with the, uh, it was the last night we were there. And so people are just documenting everything they've done all day. Uh, and they put it into this book of proceedings. So basically it was people from 100 countries with 40 different languages. We covered the same amount of topics in one day as we had the previous three by using the power of self-organization. So in ecosystems, where, where I often start and, and a lot of the folks I'm working with is with the water cycle. Because obviously we talked about those four ecosystem processes, but the water, they're all interlinked very intimately and water cycle is often a really good leverage point to work with. If we can get that right, a lot of the rest of it will come around. Um, and mostly that has to do with keeping the soil covered. So many of you might have seen different examples of these kind of rain tests on different soil types and how much runoff you get 
as a result, how much soil erodes off in a, in a rainfall event. So obviously different, you know, five different soils with different amounts of cover and different types of cover. And there's jars underneath each of them that would show this is how much rain would have infiltrated into the soil and become available then for plants and for more energy flow. And on the front side is jars that are catching all the runoff. Now obviously the one with bare soil is probably the one we would, most of us would least like to drink. Um, possibly, uh, possibly that's the case. And then the one with perennial pasture, the one that would probably, if we had to drink one, that would be it, right? Perennial pasture also has, you know, looks like it's overflowing in terms of what it infiltrated as well. So, and, and, and take a look, it's, it, that's like a half meter square, if that, of area. And just look at those amounts. So now, pretend that's, you know, 10 acres of area. How much are you losing? To, to pretend that's a whole catchment or your entire landscape. You know, uh, that's why we see that 10 billion uh, or uh, 10 tons of topsoil loss for every half ton produced because there's so much bare soil the way we're doing agriculture. So getting soil covered actually positively benefits the, all of those four ecosystem processes. That's one of the things, one of the high leverage points we tend to focus on. And there's a lot of different kind of strategies we can, we can use in that direction. Um, so Key Line has a, a subsoiling ripper that they've developed that if you do it on the key line pattern, that can really improve your water cycle in certain situations, especially where there's compaction, et cetera. Holistic plant grazing, uh, I've got a little bit more on that. Soil food web, uh, which is kind of soil biology, kind of giving attention to that, uh, amplifying that. Uh, cocktail mixes of, of cover crops and seeds and pasture cropping, which is kind of sowing an annual crop into an existing perennial base during the dormant season of the perennial. Um, so something's on the ground, on the surface at all times. You're just pumping more energy flow through that system, growing more roots. Agroforestry or wood pasture, savanna, agriculture, watershed restoration, there's a variety of things going on there. So none of these, of course, is, is a silver bullet. You know, not, not one of them would be a silver bullet, but they're all just strategies that uh, can be applied, that work well together, that integrate, produce synergies. So maybe we've got a chance at silver buckshot. I like to say. Here's a holistically managed uh, place and obviously he's got the same soils and rainfall in essence as his neighbors, but he's using a different management. What we figured out here is, is that time, the, the amount of time animals are exposed to the plants is far more important than the numbers of animals. So this would, uh, you know, this would be, especially in the past, pretty, pretty controversial in range science. Um, but it's what we see over and over. I mean, you'll find papers for sure that, uh, that are very anti-holistic management grazing approaches. You'll find other papers that support it. Um, but whatever I tell people is, you know, we can, we can compete on papers or whatever all day long, but just go visit some of these places and make up your mind. I mean, I don't care what you think at the end of the day, but go look. Go actually look at where they're doing it and make a determination. Because I've been on, on hundreds of thousands of acres of these properties, and and I don't I have yet to see a farmer or rancher who stops doing it once they've started. So that tells me something, um, you know. And there's we could also go all day with these kind of pictures. I won't, but just an example. This is in Zimbabwe. This would be the neighbor to the next photograph, which is the Savory Center in Zimbabwe. Um, so same soils, same rainfall, photograph on the same day, different management. So uh, obviously they can run a lot more animals, they have tons more wildlife at the same time, etc. cetera. Um, so holistic plant grazing then is all about getting those animals to the right place at the right time for the right reasons and with the right behavior. So the behavior is really the key part of it because in, uh, in these brittle or arid systems where these animals evolved with the grasses and um, with the, in a complete functional ecology, right, a functioning whole. Uh, we no longer have the part of the whole, uh, for the most part, that would have been there driving those, their behavior, and that was, that was predators. So those predators would have driven these large herds to bunch up more tightly 
and to keep moving through the landscape. Of course, the natural cycles of grass growth help with the mo movement as well. And once they've sort of dung and urined up a place, they kind of want to keep going as well. But it, it, it does keep them certainly tight, more tightly bunched uh, more often when, when the predators are in the system. So when you have a functional hole. So essentially what we're doing in holistic management is we're replacing the missing context. So we're using electric fence to mimic the, pr the predator uh, to create the behavior that we want to see. And what that behavior ends up doing, and of course we can manage that complexity in a, in a chart. Uh, you end up putting everything in here. This is not only about grazing, but what else is going on in your life. Um, and you could write everything down on the back of the chart that you think is going to happen during that grazing season. Uh, you're going to a wedding, you're to, you know, this and that, and the other, the social, the financial, and the ecological, and you could account for it then in this chart by the time you're done. So what Savory did, he was trained in, in military, um, uh, science and he took a lot of military science and applied it to biology basically and so he came up with a lot of these different charts and ways of doing this stuff. Um, there's some good papers on this we were talking about sharing this Richard Teague one but he studied a system in Texas which I've been on this property but it's so it's planned grazing holistic planned grazing he calls it adaptive grazing in the paper just because there's still pushback in the range science against holistic management um, versus conventionally grazed or set stocked, you know, continuous grazing. Um, he had less bare ground, more perennials, better soil aggregates, higher soil organic matter, higher uh, cation exchange capacity for basic fertility measure, right? Um, higher fungal bacterial ratios, greater water holding capacity, more available fertility. Now he's got numbers for all that in there, but numbers can, or can be pretty boring on slides. For most audiences, you guys might, uh, might not be as bored, but... <laughs> Uh, but you get the idea there. Um, and why is that able to happen really is just that it's that behavior. So it's that density, the animals bunching together, that creates an animal impact that's different than in continuous grazing. Um, so it's that and the fact that the plants have time to recover between grazings. That's really the major thing. So sometimes I think about that grazing plan that you saw up there, not so much as a grazing plan as a plant recovery plan. I'm planning the recovery of the plants in every single paddock that we're going around. So that by the time the animals come back to it, those plants have, have pretty fully recovered. So that way you're not doing any overgrazing. Because overgrazing is essentially the second bite that the animal takes in the growing season once that plant has put out new growth after being eaten the first time. So it's got no uh, 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 solar panels. It gets bitten off, right? It has very little solar panel left to put back energy. So we're talking about perennial grasses pr particularly here. So it uses the stored energy in the, uh, you know, the starches that it stores for that to put on the rest of the regrowth. Well, if that new regrowth then gets bitten off, well, it's used up its, its energy. Of course, this may take place over several years of that happening or whatever, maybe not the very first time, but eventually you're going to lose that plant. So the, what, that's what the animals will do in these pastures, right? They'll eat all the chocolates, all the stuff that's really tasty, and they'll leave behind everything they don't like and so you end up over time with the pasture with less and less of the good plants because you've overgrazed them out, palatable plants, and more and more of the kind of wolfy stuff that nobody wants to eat. Um, here's an example at, uh, of cover, the amount of cover left behind by high stock density with sheep at a village farm here in England. Uh, we just took this a couple weeks ago. Um, on the, some herbal lays that they've got going out there. But that's kind of what it can look like. That's the power of the animal impact. So now when a raindrop falls in there, it's not hitting any bare ground. It's going to infiltrate nice and soft. You have a habitat for the soil food web under there. Um, just multiple, multiple benefits. Uh, all right, I'm going to... Well, we're, we're basically at break, aren't we? Ha, 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 ha.